Good to go. Super excited today. We have an amazing podcast guest today, a double duo. We have Jen Pinches and Claire Hefford, right? Did I get it? You got it right. Well done. <laughs> I'm uh, extremely excited to have you guys on for many, many reasons. I have my full cup of tea here. I'm not going to fake a British accent and try to say it like Nick would make fun of me for. But how are you guys doing? Jen, how are you? Claire, how are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, I've had a lovely, relaxing Sunday. <laughs> yes, this is a rare, quick Sunday turnaround podcast. So we're doing a <laughs> bonus episode. But um, yes, I think there's so many fun things to talk about. I think you guys are doing incredible work. And I told Jen yesterday when we talked in private that she was a, a shining light in the world of gymnastics, especially a couple of years ago when I think a lot of people were starting to get a little frustrated and they realized there was so much. We are in the most chaotic time to ever live in gymnastics, rightfully so. But I feel like a lot of people, myself included, were getting a little bit like frustrated, a little hopeless about like, man, is this is ever going to change. And then we had a series of events between the pandemic and then athlete a and then what jen started with gym's alliance that finally i think opened the pandora's box in a good way of all the things that needed to be said and so it gave me a big fresh, uh, breath of fresh air and now you guys are off to exciting things with uh, gym is for change so i wanted to give you guys a platform to talk about all the important issues that are at hand and i also wanted to maybe push you guys forward uphill in a positive way <laughs> towards all the good things that you're doing so um, I think the best way to first start is maybe to give a little bit of like an origin story slash background. A lot of people probably know Jen. They probably know you from your, your past you know, days and what you're doing with Gymnast Alliance. And Claire, I think you're relatively new to the scene with people. I mean, you were a gymnast back in the day, but you're kind of now popping up again as someone who's important. So let's start with Jen. Can you share with people maybe your background and what you went through and then kind of what led to Athlete A and why you started Gymnast Alliance? Like, let's go with that first. Okay. So from the beginning. <laughs> when I was two years old, I started out as a baby. <laughs> Actually, I started gymnastics because I watched the Teletubbies. I don't know if you have that over there. <laughs> yeah, <too>. but, <laughs> but yeah, it looked like fun. Um, it was for a while. Uh, so yeah, I, I, for anyone who doesn't, uh, I'm not expecting people to know who I am. I, I did one Olympic Games in London 2012 for Great Britain. Um, represented GB from the age of like 13 to uh, 18 and then took a year out and then I did uh, college gymnastics for UCLA. I'm actually wearing my UCLA Bruins. Shout out. Shout out UCLA. <laughs> yeah, go Bruins. Um, so yeah, I've been through kind of recreational to elite to college um, and then so yeah, I graduated in 2016 I think um, I and I finished my UCLA career as a team manager um, slash uh, assistant coach because of injuries um sadly but it was so great to just stay involved um with that team and after that basically haven't had much to do with gymnastics until this year um so I went into just like a regular <laughs> job career um, in the tech industry and um yeah watching athlete a this year really made me feel like I have to do something and speak out because which I think a lot of people resonated with as well, um, because it wasn't just the the topic, like the um, the subject matter of the film. Like I'd watched, you know, all the trials with NASA and been like supporting the survivors how I could and like championing their like courage and bravery and like really just um, at the time supporting it. But like I think the film Athlete A coming out this year just uh hit like a little differently with me and other people in that it wasn't just about Larry Nassar it right. was about the whole culture that enabled him to act right. and um unfortunately is like also the culture that enables emotional psychological and physical abuse other types of abuse so it kind of um dawned on me that I have to say something, I have to, because I just recognized all of a sudden that um, there's these unspoken dark corners that were now in the like spotlight with Athlete A that like, I felt like I had to respond to it. Um, but initially, so this is back in June, initially I was quite scared to do or say anything. Like I wasn't really involved, like I said, with gymnastics still. Um, and I didn't want to cause a drama and cause a fuss. Um, so I contacted uh, some of my former teammates and said to them, like, what if we support the, you know, the amazing um, women in this film and just put out like a statement that says, like, basically, it doesn't have to be this way. And the culture that's shown, you know, um, with regards to like 
um, how Maggie and the other girls were treated and not their voices not being heard. Like, it doesn't have to be that way. There's such a better way. There's a positive way and we know it. And like, I've seen it. It's not every part of gymnastics that is like affected by this negative culture. Um, so I was like, maybe we can put out like a really positive statement. It can come from all of us and we can take a stand against it. And that was kind of the initial idea behind uh, what became the yeah. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> kind of a long story. Um, and so yeah, I wrote this statement, shared it, and we all posted it out and then it just snowballed from there. So that's kind of how I've ended up in this position right now, <laughs> talking to you um, and hopefully being a voice for uh, the whole community in, in, a, in a better way. Well, one, we have to recognize that, thank goodness that you did have the courage to speak up and finally say something because what you did is push a snowball downhill into validating a lot of people's experiences and their frustration and their sense of like, man, is this really what it takes to get to, you know, not even get through gymnastics the other side in a healthy way, but also like if I have high level goals or college scholarship goals or elite goals, whatever it is, I feel like it was amazing to me to see how quickly I told you yesterday, it jumped borders, right? You went from like this one little thing you thought with your team was going to happen. And then it was like people in the U S and Canada and Australia and Germany and everywhere in New Zealand, which is like, Whoa, yeah. Like I, I feel the same way you do. So thank you for uh, jumping off the cliff there and building the plane on the way down. We appreciate you. Um, Claire, do you want to uh, maybe jump into and kind of share your background and how you got to be connected with Jen? Sure. So um, I too um, watched athlete a, um, and was completely gripped by the film and everything that it was saying. Um, it, I recognized so many of the experiences myself. And then shortly after, maybe a day or two after, I started to see social media posts. And there were two in particular that really caught my attention. Um, one was from somebody that I competed against. So that was Lisa Mason. Um, and um, I then decided to write a post on Facebook myself and kind of said, yeah, of course it was Lisa Mason that said something in the UK because my experience of her was that she was literally the only gymnast uh, who wasn't, whose spirit wasn't completely crushed by the system. Um, so it made total sense that it was her that was prepared to stand up and say, yeah, this, this is bullshit and this is what happened to us. Mm -hmm. um, so I then started searching the Gymnast Alliance hashtag and I came across a post from Lewis Smith in which he was starting to talk about what kind of tallied in my mind as fairly widespread corruption essentially within BG and that it wasn't just um, the abuse that I knew and had experienced as a female gymnast, but um, this was a whole host of problematic uh, behaviors that were going on within British gymnastics at the level of contracting and on the men's side, which I think many of us know men's gymnastics is slightly different from women's gymnastics. The culture is generally better. Um, so I was kind of surprised to learn about um, the contracting issues that they'd had in 2017 and how many men had spoken up at that point. So uh, I then started to do my research and I came across um, a couple of people on um, Twitter who were parents and they were speaking about their experience of being whistleblowers. And from that, I realized that um, we, I, uh, we had something in common, which was that um, I had basically been haunted by my own gymnastic experiences. Um, I'm from a different generation of gymnasts. I trained in the 90s. And um, I quit when I was 15 because of the abuse. I didn't want it in my life anymore. I found it to be a very toxic culture. Um, and I then went and competed in athletics. But um, 10 years uh, later, when I retired from athletics, that was the point at which um, I guess the stuff that I'd experienced myself, uh, it came back through kind of haunting experiences. And I, I went on a journey through the world of gymnastics in the UK um, because I had this real desire, again, like Lisa Mason had, as a like a 28 year old, I wanted to go back and compete. And that just had never been an option for me. When I was 15 and I quit, I was told, you can't continue training. It's 30 hours a week or nothing. Um, and so it was nothing. Um, and I took all that energy and drive and physical conditioning, which was really at a high level, um, and took it into athletics. Um, but I, I missed gymnastics so much that once I hit 28, my body was like, just get back in the gym. Um, and I, I did adult gymnastics for a while. I ended up training with a, a group of 
boys um, and a men's coach for a little bit for uh, around three months. And then I ended up um, at a, a gym club training with a group of 13 year old girls because I wanted to compete. And um, it was a very bizarre experience to be a 30 year old in the, in the gym training with 13 year old girls, but that was the only way I could get coaching and access to proper training facilities. Um, and in the process, one day, um, I witnessed a horrific attack on uh, a 10 year old girl um, where she was str strangled. Um, and it was very disturbing and it was very upsetting to watch. I went away and I reported it to British Gymnastics. And in the process of becoming a whistleblower, um, I felt threatened. I experienced again that culture of fear that even though I'd worked in essentially safeguarding roles myself before um, in professional settings. Um, even though I knew all about health and self safety procedures uh, at work, um, I, I was really terrified when I made that report. And um, the, what happened with it was it was, uh, it, it went to the police, it was investigated, but when it was handed back to British Gymnastics, they reinstated that coach. So uh, that was the point at which I realized there was some major problems. Um, and I was so fearful because the club, I thought the club knew that it was me that had made the report. Um, so I just I just left, I never went back and I thought, I don't want anything to do with gymnastics. It's it's just, I, my experience myself as a, as a teenager had been really bad. And I was coached by the first Russian who came to the UK. So you know, I lived in a Soviet training regime for five years. That was bad enough, but then to witness this when I went back into the sport, um, that was really a difficult thing for me. So yeah, fast forward to um, watching Athlete A and I thought it's time to do something. Um, and I got in touch with a number of my teammates because I've been wanting to talk about our experiences and what we'd, what we'd experienced in the 90s for a long time, but I hadn't been brave enough. And Athlete A was just then the catalyst to make us all feel it was okay to, to talk about um, what happened to us. So we started meeting on Zoom um, and talking about our experiences and very quickly decided that we wanted to um, move forward with a group legal action. And um, it just so happened that last year I had met a very esteemed um, QC and lawyer um, and I got in touch with them. Uh, I spoke to them on a Friday. They said, tell me everything you know. And um, by the end of the call, they said, we want to take this on, give us the weekend to research it. And by Monday, they came back to me and said, we're going to do this. We're going to put this really incredible legal team together mm -hmm. um, and we will make this happen. And they've been in an amazing support ever since. So um, it was through doing that that I then got in touch with Jennifer. There you go. There you go. Uh, I'm so happy I'm so to happy have you. You don't need to mute. You. Maybe yeah. when uh, you're an echo. Yeah. Oh. Um, I, I don't have an echo. It's okay. Do I? Do I, have, I no, can hear an echo on you. Yeah, I'm just going to mute myself if I'm not talking. Yeah, it's okay. I think that's fine. Um, I'm really happy to hear both of your like kind of big story arcs leading up to where you were because it makes, I mean, I knew bits and pieces, but it makes so much more sense now, right? And I think a lot of um, people who are listening and as we go through the conversation to what you guys are doing now will make sense about, you know, how you guys have skin in the game and how you guys understand the nuances of this. Because I think that's something that many people within the gymnastics community don't like, I guess, appreciate with the people is like, they don't understand, you're not part of the world, but like you guys are part of the world and you do get it. And so I think one thing that's really important to paint the picture is, is what is it from, if Jennifer say listens to this, I want to give her amazing credit for taking the big courage to step to one writer book and then make the athlete, aid because that was the big domino that helped a lot of us. I can tell you for a fact that when I kind of went through the, the years of my medical stuff and uh, being a coach and getting up to that, I was so frustrated. I was like, this is crazy. Like at a gut level, I feel terrible about what's happening. I know a lot of other of my coaches and friends, my former gymnasts and teammates feel, and I just met with more and more people who are tired of injuries and getting yelled at and getting screamed at and zero scientific evidence being used in some of the training principles or like proper ways to work with interdisciplinary teams. Everybody has this cute, like universal feeling of like, this just doesn't feel right. And a lot of coaches are burnt out and frustrated. Great coaches who are trying to do the right thing were super burnt out and frustrated and I think that unfortunately they just kind of went along with what was being done because that was what was taught to us and what was done. But for me, when I watched athlete a, I felt so much of that get rehashed about like, yes, this is my frustration or like, I'm tired of watching 40 girls come to my clinic with broken backs and elbow surgeries, then quitting and being like the coaches just forget about them and be like, Oh, that's a bummer. Good luck. 
you know, and it's, that's the end of it. I'm like, this is absolutely ridiculous. And in the past, when I tried to, or my friends tried to speak up about some of these things, we were just, we stopped getting invited into Congresses. We stopped getting invited to these special inner circle, you know, meetings with the right people and the right things. And I was like, this is complete bullshit that nobody wants to hear a different opinion of what's best for the kid and the kid suffers. So it's not every coach. And I really want to say that from the beginning, that this is a minority of coaches who are doing terrible things to coaches or to kids. Most coaches, I feel, are good people who got terrible education. And so that's for me what was ignited in Athlete A was hearing all of the garbage that's been allowed to happen the last 10, 15, 20 years and how everyone feels the same way. And it's crazy how much terrible suffering had to happen in terms of sexual abuse or things before we finally addressed the real elephant in the room. So that was personally for me, but I'd like to hear from maybe Jen first about what was it within Athlete A that really, I guess, resonated the most with you? I know you said you had some injuries you dealt with, you had some issues when you were younger, but I think that's going to be an important thing to highlight because when we talk about what you're trying to do with gym is for change it'll map up to why you have specific initiatives you know what i mean yeah so for me the thing that stood out in athlete a was the part and i think a few people have quoted this where jen Jay says something like you think your ankle hurts and you're um training 30 hours a week and you're working really hard or whatever um but you're told that you're fine and you're lazy and nothing's wrong um and that to me just hit home as to the fact that the athlete's voice and the athlete's perception is obviously just so misaligned with some coaches uh, perception and, and, and idea and it's just like how can we have these gymnasts thinking that they could possibly be lazy or fat or that their pain isn't real given the clear evidence of the, how much hard work they are doing like it just it just <laughs> made no sense when you say it when you hear somebody else saying it and i know that uh, a, a lot of people have felt that way like they have had their injuries ignored and they have had their voice not be a central part of the conversation and their relationship with their coach has not always been collaborative and I don't understand why it shouldn't be like if we're trying to get the best results for gymnasts then surely collaborating with those gymnasts say to them what's going to work for you what's going to motivate you like what do you feel is going to be the best way to do it but like just having this culture of telling them they're wrong and they need to be robots and do as they're told. It's just that quote, that, just, that quote spoke to me like, this has to change. Like we just we have to listen to the athletes and we have to stop having these individuals believing that they're like, they're being gaslit, they, you know, believing that they're weak or fat or lazy when they're so clearly not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well said. Claire, what about you? Is it, were there things from the Athlete A film that particularly sparked you? And then I'll definitely share mine. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's probably two key things. Um, one, again, um, just to put it slightly different way, but the same point as Jen, which is uh, the infantilization of female athletes, particularly for me, that's been my experience. I think with on the men's side, there's much more of a kind of um, a brotherly sort of um, fraternity type uh, vibe that goes on between coaches and athletes. There's more of a partnership. But on the women's side, it's, it's pure infantilization of the bodies and of the minds. And what that allows is this space in which, um, again, it's sort of, I'm saying the same thing that Jennifer Sayers said, but in a slightly different way, which is that um, you get caught between um, child and adult, and it forms a double bind in which the gymnast can never win. The coach always wins because if you respond to, when they're displeased, when the coach is displeased with you, if you respond to them, by looking down, crying, becoming upset. They'll say, you're pathetic, you're not worth my attention. If you look them in the eye and behave like an adult, um, they say you're defiant. So there, there is this, this setup um, in which the, the athlete can never win. And, and that really feels for me like a massive injustice. Um, and it feels like the sport doesn't belong to the gymnasts, it belongs to the coaches that have these belief systems and that leads on to my second point which is they ha they have a belief system and i've i've been in i've been doing coaching qualifications for the last two years and i've been into recreational clubs and observed how this operates really from the low level right up to the top 
and it's what I would call the mass foddering system. Um, so basically the system of elite gymnastics operates on the 1% making it to the top. And uh, you have to have huge numbers of kids go through the clubs at a recreational level to pick out these one or two gymnasts that the coach deems might be uh, the kind of gymnast that they want to work with. And for me, this is completely insanity as somebody that's gone and done athletics and loved every minute of my athletics career. Uh, what I know to be true is that um, the person in charge of the athletic performance is that individual and their motivation and their inner drive is absolutely what will allow them to go on to succeed at the highest levels. But in gymnastics, this idea doesn't exist at all. It's absolutely based on a system of wanting the most compliant, the most docile, the least uh, argumentative gymnasts that they can find, which ultimately means that they're missing out on all of the athletes who have drive, who have ideas, who could push the sport forward. And I think that that's how we've arrived at where we are today in, in a situation where athlete A's now come out and, and people are up in arms because for 30 years, um, all the people who had new ideas who could have contributed towards pushing the sport forward have been pushed out. And so that means the sport has never moved forward. And from a legal perspective, it means that when we've had these moments where um, bad things have happened, people have died, serious injuries have happened, legally the sport should have taken those opportunities to autocorrect and they, and they just didn't. And that's where we're at now. That's why we're here because for 30 years, nothing's changed and all the people who could have changed the sport were just pushed to the side. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really happy you said that because it definitely feeds into, I think, what resonated with me with Athlete A. And then I'll make a very important point about your your concepts about the sport not moving forward, especially from the medical side and the research side, the strength conditioning side. Like it's, it's baffling how far behind gymnastics is compared to other sports. But I think for me, the, the point in the movie when I think it was like accumulation of the whole movie was just so incredible. But like when I watched, I remember watching these before, but when I watched the testimony, especially of Kyle Stevens and her talking about her dad and her relationship with her dad, and then Caitlin Ohashi's story and like some of the testimonies that like Maddie Larson's, for example, that's when I started crying in the movie because it was just like, I think people, especially in the coaching world sometimes, but also parents too, who get caught up in the fame and the glory and the shiny gold medals and the scholarships and whatever else it is, you miss the real impact that, that gymnastics has on these kids' lives. And I think that it transcends so much just their gymnastics career and their athletic men where these young kids and especially young females, I think I have the most empathy. I mean, as a guy, this happens in the side, but I have so much empathy for young females, especially the ones that I coach and others, because it's so it's such a turmoil and chaotic time of their life that when you are already insecure and struggling with puberty or the way you look or the way you behave and you're learning stuff, and then you have all the social pressures of gymnastics, and then you have someone on top of you all the time about your gymnastics career, it's devastating on their mental health sometimes. And I think so many young females in particular have massive issues with depression or social anxiety or comparison because they don't have the social support they need in the gym and they get the opposite, which is a constant perfectionist. You're never good enough. It's not quite there. If you're hurt, go off to the side. Don't waste my time. You're not worthy of me. Kind of all that it's complete trash that I think unfortunately perpetuated in the eighties and the nineties, because that is what that has serious issues talking about people who tried to commit suicide or under so much pressure, they were mentally and physically so unwell because of what was happening in the gymnastics climate. Right. And I think, that is the responsibility of us of why you have to be willing to swallow the hard truth and deal with the issues at hand. And you can't look away from them because the, the possible ramifications can be life threatening. And I think that's what moved me so much in athlete A is when I was like, when I was starting to be like, I'm, I'm just going to throw caution to the wayside and start saying how I feel and really especially in the clinic with people around medical injuries. You know, I used to have a lot of like tug and war dances between high level coaches and some parents and stuff where they were worried about injuries and pushing for scholarships. And I was like, no, this is how I feel. You need to rest six weeks and this is a fracture. And if they don't like it, then they can, we can have a conversation about it and they can call me directly. You know, I stopped caring about people's opinions because it was so blurry around these lines of injuries and overtraining and strength. Right. And I think this goes to the second point that I want to say is like, you mentioned how like, we now know from 30 for 30 podcasts and other places that like this idea of like, you have to be tiny and skinny and pre puberty and you have to be easier to spot and little to get successful is complete bullshit. And there's no scientific fact behind that at all. 
There's no research behind pre-puberty is the max of your strength and power and conditioning and your, and your longevity. There's zero support behind year round training for, for all young gymnasts, right? In all sports, there's zero support behind early periodization and trying to get someone to do only gymnastics from a young age, like maybe a little bit on the earlier side. Yes, I agree with that, right? Like the age in a study we just finished was the average age of early specialization was eight. That's the youngest that like the middle age of when people specialize with most people around six. So like, that's, again, there's, so much evidence against that, right? And we see with coronavirus now what off seasons do. We see so much other stuff. Not using strength conditioning and formal weightlifting has got zero support behind it and evidence. And everything comes down to, and I talked to Jen about this yesterday, when you ask somebody, okay, I hear you. Tell me why you still believe in tiny, pre-puberty, no strength and conditioning, year-round training, early specialization. Tell me why. And they go, well, that was successful. That's that's what this person did to be successful. Like, okay, so the N of 0.005% success with 40 other athletes who burnt out in that model or got hurt, how in the world is that successful, right? And when you really get down to those hard conversations, like, well, that's just what we do. And that's, that's, that's the way it's been done. It's like, okay, I'm not taking that at face value. That's not true. And you know what I mean? All of our problems come from ignoring scientific literature and following the best practices of expert gymnastics coaches who have entire gyms of kids that are successful, multiple level 10 athletes going to scholarship, kids that are happy, kids that are enjoying coming back, right? You add that with scientific literature, that's when you realize that the model that we have right now, you can't win the game because the rules are broken. The rules are stacked against you. You're playing with how it's money against the deck and it's impossible to be successful in this model. And so I don't think I've ever fully said that on the podcast, but that's extreme. That's how I feel. I truly feel that what we're doing now is impossible to be successful at a, at a long-term dosage stage. It's just not going to happen. So I think that's so important to realize for people because everyone is, t is, is like crawling tooth and nail uphill when the problem is the game, not the way we're playing it. So what are your guys thoughts yeah. on that, Jen? I think that um, for those people that still believe you need to be super tiny and train all the time and, um, and that's what success is and that's what success looks like, like really they need to change their definition of success because if they think successful is, okay, but look at this one gymnast there, like look at all the medals they have and look at all the skills they can do and it works for them and, and they're ignoring that other 99% of gymnasts that don't make it that far, that are injured, that quit because they hate it, that have long-term damage, um, then that's not successful. Like you can't look at one person and be like, that individual is successful for this country, therefore this country is successful. Like, no, like take a step back, like get some perspective that is not successful. And that's like really important. And it makes re me really angry because, um, you know, I thought that I peaked at 16. And when I went to the Olympics at 18, I was already kind of on the way down because I was getting old and like, you know, old and puty and heavier and, and, and whatever. And, and I had to train all the time and work harder. And, and if only the Olympics had been like two years earlier or whatever, like, and that's so annoying because like, why didn't I have the opportunity to think that I could keep getting better and stronger and I didn't have to just try and stay this like tiny teenager to be successful. Like I could have done so much better. I could have been so much happier. I could have been so much healthier, so much more successful. Like, um, so it makes me personally annoyed. And, and it also, um, and this is something uh, Claire said to me and other people have said to me before it also doesn't even fit the description of the sport of women's artistic gymnastics because really it's girls artistic gymnastics you know and if we want women to be athletes doing this sport like we need to uh, have healthy methods that actually foster um, women to be able to you know that in a mentally and physically healthy way yeah very well said Claire do you have anything to maybe chime in here um, yeah, th this is a, a, a big bugbear for me, for sure, um, is the idea that because of Nadia Comaneci, because of Olga Corbett, we have a sport which is focused on aesthetics. I want to see gymnastics become a sport that's focused on aptitude, not aesthetics. It's not a beauty parlor, it's sport. And the fact that we're still having this conversation in 2020 is just demeaning. And it shows the amount of misogyny that is woven into the fabric of what gymnastics is. And that has to just end. Um, this is a women in sport issue. And we really, really need to deal with uh, what exactly is gymnastics? What is its purpose? Why do the men have to do one set of um, events and the women do another set of events? Um, from a gender point of view, the, the sport has just not kept up with society. And um, yeah, I think that I think that's 
just very retrograde, basically. Um, and partly, I think, when you look at the administrators of the sport in so many ways, um, they are very behind the times. And I guess Russia becomes quite a big problem in that, in that uh, my understanding is there are a, a large number of uh, officials at FIG who come from the Russian system. And we kind of know where Russia's at in terms of um, kind of gender politics and um, sexual politics now. And so I'm not really sure what the answer is going to be, but essentially there is a culture war that could now take place within gymnastics because it's so out of step with modern society. Yeah, especially here in the westernized culture of the U.S., we see too, and as, as a man, as someone who coaches a yellow young girls I, I care deeply about in, in their development, there's nothing more awful than seeing the hypersexualization that happens with young females in the sport of gymnastics. I think that is the most disgusting thing as a man that I see. And I hope to God that the rules that change, the reflections that we have can also reflect the fact that we need to stop that in its tracks. And I think a lot of other sports have progressed significantly on that, but we still have a lot of old school 80s and 90s, like, you know, uh, beliefs and cultural norms that are accepted when in reality they're horrific for young athletes to develop in guys and girls, not just females. So I'm very happy you said that. I think one more note I want to make on the coaches thing and before we move on to maybe like what we can think about for change and positive moving forward here is a big self audit that I had that I started to realize was my biggest reason that I need to change the way I approach in um, my day to day coaching stuff was and I see this now with a lot of high level coaches, unfortunately, still is that when things go well, they're very quick to take credit and take a picture and put it on Facebook or Instagram and say how, you know, they did all the coaching and blah, blah, blah. And I'm such a great technician. And they're very quick to sit at the bar after a meeting and let everyone just praise them and pamper them with how awesome all their stuff is. But when shit hits the fan and things go wrong and they have an injury or kids burn out or people leave or they don't have a great performance in the meet, who's the first one to blame? It's the gym's fault. You didn't work hard enough. You didn't do this. Well, if you were paying attention, you would have gotten hurt. If you had slept better, if you had ate better, if you had done this. And it's like, well, where's the personal accountability for the person who made that training program? Like, show me your periodization. Show me your scientific methods for strength and conditioning. Show me your flexibility techniques. Show me your motivation techniques. Show me your sports psychologist and who you work with. Like, show me those things as well. If you only take credit for the good things, but then you can't fall on the sword and take accountability when things go bad, then that's a huge double standard. And that's unrealistic. And that's very, very mean to the kids, right? And I think the best examples of coaches I've had in the podcast, like Amy and Nick and other people realize this is a partnership. This is a partnership, a professional partnership towards a common goal and equal positive and negative has to go to both parties. Whereas, okay, here's what I did wrong as a coach. Here's what I can change. Here's who I need to work with. I don't know this, but also maybe here are some behaviors that you can change to also lead towards positive success. Don't attack the athlete as a human say like, okay, what well, we're going to change a few choices. And if you're someone who has a bunch of injuries in your gym, or you notice a trend of, of not the best motivation techniques, but you're very quick to point fingers only at the athletes. But then when things go well at a meet, you jump to the parade party and say how great it is. You have to seriously have a moment of self-reflection and realize if what you're doing is optimal because there's always two people in every part of good or bad success. And I think that's very, very important for people to kind of dwell on. So um, moving on from there, let's let's talk about me. The, the the biggest thing we feel are resistance points, and then we'll talk about solutions for positive things. So Jen, what do you think is the biggest like elephant in the room or like resistance to cultural change? Why is it still so stubborn? Why do you think people are not, you know, maybe jumping on board with new ideas and new concepts? I think partly it's that people are repeating what they've been taught or what's happened to them. The coaches that are using damaging techniques, I don't believe that people come into the sport with any intent to harm or that there's just like a pandemic of evil people in, in gymnastics. Um, I think that people um, are missing a better example in a lot of uh, cases and a clear um what i want to push is as much evidence and education as possible um that demonstrates how what to do instead um and the people i respect the most are those that can self-reflect and say okay maybe here's something that went wrong but they can always keep learning and progressing um and improving um their approach to the sport so um I think, yeah, I think the more that we talk about it, and I think what Gymnast Alliance and Athlete A and um, has done so far this year, and you are hugely helpful with this as well, Dave, um, is is like get, having these conversations, is getting the transparency out there, is talking about it and being like, wait a minute, like this doesn't work. There's a better way. And here's what the better way is. Here's the answers, not just the problems. Um, and I think that will massively break down the barriers because as soon as people realize that, 
um, not only is there a better way, but the better way is actually more successful in terms of their original um, definition of success. Because once gymnasts are happier and healthier, they are going to get better results and they're going to get better results for longer. Then everyone's going to want to jump on board and do the same thing because they just want the results. They just want to be successful, you know, for themselves and the gymnasts. So um, I think, yeah, transparency and education are like crucial to all of this. Yes, I completely agree. Claire, what do you think? What do you think of the of reason we're still kind of stuck in the mud? I think that gymnastics uh, for a long time and still is an echo chamber. Um, I think if you look at other sports, for example, in the UK, um, when you listen to uh, rugby players or say the, the chief executive of, of um, the England team or the, the England football managers, they all have um, a kind of dialogue going on with other coaches, other um, administration staff in these other sports. They're looking, what is best practice in cricket? What is best practice in swimming? They are exchanging knowledge, resources, ideas to push their sports forward. Um, gymnastics doesn't dialogue with anybody. Um, and I think that many, I mean, particularly in the UK, essentially what we've got at the moment is a situation in which a number of uh, the most successful coaches who've been the most successful coaches for the last 20, 30 years are currently suspended. Um, they are being investigated and they all know each other. They're all friends. This is a network of individuals who've kind of run a cabal in the, the UK gymnastics scene. And they're basically not very nice individuals. So, um, you know, their method of uh, keeping a hold on the sport has been to, to bully everybody out. So um, again, it's back to the same issue that anyone who's ever had any good ideas has been pushed out of the sport and hasn't been able to share them. And the people who remain at the top are remaining at the top, not because they're, they're the most brilliant, but because they fought the hardest and bullied people to get the positions that they're in. Yeah, I'm happy you said that. And I think your your point about not having questions is or dialogue is people are scared to ask the questions because they're afraid of the answers. You know what I mean? And that's kind of what I've gone through in transformation of learning about. I mean, the best thing I did, and this is this was serendipity, luck, it was everything, right? Is that I my first job, my first interactions with like people like Dave Duraney, who was an Olympian here, he was starting a camp full of tons of strength and conditioning coaches and other people outside the sports. And I just happened to get dropped into that little pool. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know anything. I was like, I learned from the best energy systems and cardio, uh, you know, coach and uh, the planet probably. And I was like, I've never heard any of this in my traditional gymnastics coaching methodology. Like where was this in my coaching starting stuff like that? So like, I think a lot of my early success and why people latched onto me is because I was just taking stuff that was in the scientific literature and saying like, well, I think gymnastics should do this, you know? And they're like, Oh, that's a nice idea. I'm like, yeah, this is like 2000. This, this research article was written by Dr. Sands on gymnast lifting weights. Right. So I was lucky to have that, but I, I think every, everything we're talking about is summarizing what we need to do is take the medical model of, of education and copy paste it onto the gymnastics coaching certification, right? Like, and I've said this in other podcasts, but people need to hear this is I think the only way forward is a mandatory one year split academic and mentorship program for you to be eligible to coach. And there should be a coach, coaching licensure, especially here in the States or anywhere else, anywhere worldwide. And you should have to go through didactic coursework on flexibility and strength and motivation and skill work and spotting and all the right things that you need from everybody. And that should be a split fee between your gym or maybe the governing body. And also you should fork up some money too and put it in because you have, you're going to invest your time and your resources. So there should be a one year mandatory for anybody coaching. But if you want to go to level here in the States, level nine, level 10, elite, junior elite college, you should do another year where you work with the very, like the Amy Bormans of the world and the Knicks of the world and the best coaches who have been proven ethically and morally to do the right thing, but also have great technical knowledge and will give you solutions to your problems. Right. And I think I'm empathetic towards coaches and I want to talk about this kind of whiplash effect that's coming, but I'm empathetic because coaches have been asked to be 47 different people. Like strength and conditioning is the perfect example. Like it's a full-time job to be a strength and conditioning coach. It's a full-time job to be a nutritionist. It's a full-time job to be a mental health provider. And it's like, it's impossible for you to be able to juggle all those plates. So you either need to learn those things and be, uh, you know, agile in those to direct to the proper person, 
or you need to swallow your pride and be like, this is not for me. I need somebody else on my team to do this. And so it should be a one year minimum, a two year for your advanced stuff. And then you should be required every year, like in the medical model, you need to take continuing education courses every year because new research comes out every single year. I've, I've learned seven different ways to teach you your Chanko since starting out when I was 15 years old, because techniques have evolved. And what I thought was working is, is now a new way because expert coaches have shown that. So like, for me, that's the only way forward in terms of like, if we actually want to hold people accountable, because let's be real, the people who think they're awesome and have huge egos are not going to want to put in the work and they're not going to want to be, you know, humble enough to say, I don't know something and they're going to fail their tests and they're going to get exposed and they're going to get kicked out. Right. And that's maybe unfortunate. That's what needs to happen. Or some people are the older guard who maybe were stubborn guard of the middle ages. They're not going to want to put in the work and they're going to hang their hat up and be like, ah, oh, this is too much. Like they're going to have this, in, this God complex where they feel like oh, it, uh, this is not this. I'm too good for this. And they're going to move on. And maybe that's the way that we get some, some new fresh blood in the air. But if we start like the the middle generation of coaches now, who are like the younger athletes who became coaches like in, in this new middle era are the ones that I talk to the most with and consult with the most. And they're the ones who are like, give me it all. I want to learn it all. I want to help. And they have enormous success on the national level. And then they kind of like put pressure uphill on the, the people who are maybe in their forties, fifties and sixties uh, who, you know, I don't want to overgeneralize and say nobody in the older regime wants to learn. I have some great people who do, but um, for the majority of the stuff is they put pressure on their gym club owners to change. And then it finally trickles over. So I feel like that's where we need to make our changes. Like the, club level and those mid-level or communities that like because because just telling the ngbs like tear down your whole curriculum and start over like yeah good luck with that financially like that's not going to happen but if you're like giving people what they need you ask what do you need help with how can i help you what do you i, I get frustrated with parents i'm frustrated with these kids who don't want to work out because they're have social media stuff too much tiktok i can't get them to focus it's all tiktok right like if we gave them solutions to their problems they would feel more on board to change right now. I still feel it's like a oh, man, you're screwing up everything. Like you need to change everything like good luck. And it's like, yeah, that's not going to feel great to change. So that's my two cents, but I don't know. Is there any other thoughts on that before we move on to maybe the next segue? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my, my thought would be um, two things. Uh, again, just mentioning athletics, just because that was one of my experiences when I quit gymnastics. Um, the model that we've had in athletics, which has been slightly problematic over the last 20 years in the UK, has been that the EIS, um, who the English Institute of Sport, they've been responsible for bringing a lot of sports science into athletics and athletics training, recovery, coaching, strength, conditioning, support. Um, and in many ways in athletics, they've done as much harm as they've done good because athletics has always been built traditionally on coaching relationships in which a lovely, kindly local club coach coaches an athlete from the age of 10 all the way through to uh, almost Olympic level, at which point the athlete invariably moves on to a world renowned coach and that's their career made. But they've basically, that athlete's done 20 years with that same coach who perhaps wasn't technically minded, but put in so much psychological support. Was that person's mentor and that? you know, almost more significant a parent than the parent. They've they've been there at the track with them doing all of the emotional groundwork so that that athlete can then go on and compete at the highest levels. Gymnastics is a completely different situation um, because of the amount of technical knowledge required. So as you say, um, it's insane that um, things like strength and conditioning and those sort of medical science models have not made their way into gymnastics, given um, not only the, the amount of technical knowledge needed to coach each apparatus, um, the fact that not every coach is equally good at coaching each apparatus piece and discipline, um, but also it's been happening in this situation in which the coaches have used a model for coaching, which has been to bully the athletes. So those athletes have never had the emotional support either. So, yeah, I mean, I think everything you've just said makes total sense, given how technical a sport it is and how um, over 30 years it's changed. When, when I trained 30 years ago, I had one coach. Um, he was Russian and he was very hot actually on strength conditioning. We, the majority of our training was strength conditioning. Um, and we had a choreographer and half of our training was also dance work. She was Bolshoi ballet trained and we did three hours of, of ballet a day to prepare us. But gymnastics is a different sport now. It's 
there's so much more athleticism, so much more difficulty level in terms of the bars and the tumbles that you get on the floor um, and the vaults have changed. So the, the physical preparations have changed and the technical knowledge has changed and is changing all the time. So yeah, everything that you've suggested makes 100% sense in that context. It, it's a different sport than it used to be and the coaches need different knowledge now. Yeah, I totally agree. Jen, you got anything on that? I'm just thinking on a practical level, like you said, like it's so, there's so many technical parts to gymnastics. Um, ultimately, maybe we just all need to collaborate more. Like if it's the case that one gym can't get, you know, a, a, an expert in every area, then can't we have regional networks of experts that people can, you know, collaborate between? If, if collaboration, we know that collaboration and teamwork is so important to all sports and it's so important between the gymnast and the coach, like why can't we just carry that out through to dance and strength and um, medical support? And Because it's not realistic that every single club's going to have their own individual experts for every single one of these areas. But um, it is far more realistic that we can share these ideas and that we can share the resources and that we can share, like again, like the education uh, is this the most important thing that's going to affect the end result so if we can just put it out there <laughs> it doesn't like maybe it's not as complicated as we're making it out to be maybe we just need to talk more yeah no i agree and i can i can share some experiences from the guy's side i think especially as a younger athlete growing up when you know i think one of the biggest things is we don't have the numbers to burn through that i think the women's side does where we we only have so many guys and so many colleges that it's really hard to get you know a lot of people onto a, a high level stage but Growing up in clinics and stuff like that, like it was totally, maybe it's because there's only a few of us like around like in each state or whatever, but like it was completely like sharing knowledge. Hey, what do you, hey, you want to watch this guy? I'll watch on P bars. You come watch my guys. They need a fresh set of eyes. Like, I don't know I'm missing something here. It was always, rarely was it this like hidden secret cloak and dagger. I heard that term someone I was traveling, like you have to know this person or it's standoffish or like very competitive that I'm not going to share my secrets because I don't want you to win and this and that. That is like the opposite in my experiences with the female side is like, not always. And I think it's changing now more, but like, especially when I was growing up my coaching career, it was very standoffish and it was very like, you had to know certain people and be buddy, buddy to learn this special technique. And you had to like, you know, win over this special coach to come to your gym and give a clinic. And it was, we all bowed down to you because you're so great. And it's like, it's baffling to me. Like when I was a young male coach, especially starting in, in women's gymnastics, when I got to those clinics or stuff like that, and it was like a, a rite of passage to know the right people and learn the special techniques. I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is ridiculous. I was like, how is this like helpful for anyone to win? But also too, all you're doing is hurting the athlete. Why in the world would I hold back my knowledge if I knew it was going to help uh, somebody down the road or another gym because the rising tide lifts all boats, right? Like if you, if I help you and you help me, there's tons of stuff I don't know. And we're going to have more interactions and you can watch my, like, I, I just don't get that. I never understood that in the female side, like, especially as I ascended up to the consulting with some of the national teams and traveling around the world, it was like this weird, awkward, like dynamic and special coaching high form, high performance forms of like, you had to know the special people and have this like four passwords to get the right idea for how to teach a flick lay. I was like, dude, you guys are crazy right now. And then it became like middle school all over again. You go to like the bar after and like hang out with someone. And it's like this very clicky gossipy, like who knows who kind of thing. I was like, you guys suck. I'm not hanging out with any of you. This is a waste of my time. This is super boring. So yeah, I come a, back to the egos, isn't it? Like I'm the best, my gym's the best, I'm the best coach, whatever. Like stop, like it's not about that. What's best for the athlete? What's best for the gymnast? That's what's best for your reputation. <laughs> That goes back to too, right? Like, who is this about? Is this about the coach or is this about the athlete, right? Is this like the athlete standing in the middle and we're all helping you? Like I've always, I've, I've taken this analogy from a book that I read about like the, the athlete is the hero in the story. We're their guides, right? It's not the other way around. We're not the hero in the story. And if you're getting into coaching because you want to be the hero in the story, please politely find a new profession, right? Because if you're doing it for yourself and for your money and status and fame and buy the things and the Instagrams and all that stuff, like please exit stage left because we don't have time for that. It's not going to help anybody. And honestly, as someone who had that when I was younger, uh, it only makes you miserable, right? Like I'm, I promise you it's a treadmill. You only have, there's no amount of money and famous Instagram likes or parents telling you you're great that's going to make you happy. Like that comes from self-esteem and your own self-worth. So like, I promise you, it's not going to end well either way. So random rant before we move on. <laughs> um, so let's go on the positive side. Let's, <laughs> I think we just, I think we've successfully checked off a lot of the things that are not good, but I'm really excited because you guys, I feel like you, you, along with me share the idea that like there's, there's, you have to acknowledge and recognize what is bad, but if you only recognize what is bad and don't offer constructive solutions, you're doing, you're making noise. You're not making progress. Right. And I think, 
Jen and I talked about this. I'm so 1000% in support of hearing everyone's experiences and, and wanting to know what's wrong and understanding what's going wrong. I, I, everyone should have their voice and tell their story. But at some point, there comes a, a, a time when you have to put down your megaphone and pick up a shovel if you want to actually get things to change for positive. So I'm curious to hear, let's start with, let's go with the magic wand question, which is great. If you had a magic wand and you could change one thing like snap of the fingers, what would you change first? And what would you want everyone to hear? NGBs, everybody else, the college level, what else? What would you think would be the first order of business that you know needs to happen? So Jen, let's go with you first, just because I'm going through my Brady Bunch order. <laughs> <laughs> um this is such a tough question for me to answer because like the more I think about the sport and there's so many aspects to it that like could be better um but I think it always comes back to um what we were talking about like putting the athlete in the center the communication and the relationship there I think if there's a magic wand and I could just get everyone to see and be educated on the fact that that partnership actually works better and is more rewarding like for the individual coach and the individual athlete and more rewarding in terms of achieving success like that would be the one thing so it's no longer ever about um telling them what to do and uh that's the end of it and that's how it's always been done it's always a continuous conversation working things out together and also using the latest research and the latest science to constantly inform the next decision that's being made like it's that back and forth collaboration um that would be the one thing if everyone had that then we could work out all the little other things that maybe the athlete doesn't feel good about this way or this thing that you said or because you would be having the conversation and a lot of times the conversation just isn't had in the first place and um you know, maybe the coach thinks that they are doing the best thing for the gymnast and the gymnast just wants to please. So they think that they're happy, you know, there's, and the conversation could just, um, prevent a lot of hurt in the long run. So, um, yeah, yeah that's a, that's not a very clean answer, but <laughs> I think it was great. I think it was great. <laughs> Claire, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. I, I think that it's really important that we credit the athletes with the intelligence that they deserve. Um, it's about partnerships and, and as Jen said before, collaboration is one simple way through that. Stop pitting clubs against each other, stop expecting clubs to have all the knowledge within one, one club um, and, and share the knowledge uh, around so that everybody can improve together. Yeah, yeah super well super said. Well I think my, I've, I've changed this question. I've asked this question for probably like, I don't know, 50 people now on the podcast over and over. And I keep evolving my own answer for me personally. If I could have a magic wand and I could wish I would want everyone to stop, stop putting their sense of self-esteem and their happiness on other people or other things. I think that that was the biggest change for me is when I handled an accountability and responsibility for my own personal, you know, life in my own, like I was dragging a lot of my personal life and my fears and my insecurities into my coaching practice. And because I had issues personally with my own source of self-esteem, I thought that I needed the girls doing well to perform well and had a level 10 team and the scholarships and stuff for me to be like, oh, I'm a good person. I'm a good coach, blah, blah, blah. So I, I realized harshly a couple of years ago that when I was able to take more accountability for my own source of like, self-esteem and happiness like and i i admitted my insecurities and my fear of the unknown right that's a big problem that a lot of coaches have right now but also too like my fear of, of of social judgment from my peers around me other coaches and other people we competed against i was so paralyzed by what people thought about me and their their opinions valued so much more than my own opinion of myself that it led me to be extremely vulnerable and that's when i developed an ego and that's when i started to be standoffish and that's when i started to yell more because i was insecure about things going well and the more and more that i worked on myself and found ways to be happy and have self-esteem without the need for the girls doing well or money or instagram or anything it's amazing how much better my life was regardless of the gymnastic stuff that was happening and so like that's what I would like people to try to understand is that you could be so much happier in your daily coaching life and less burnt out and less frustrated if you stopped caring so much about what everybody else thought of you and you just got your source of self-esteem from just being a good person and having values and doing the right thing and trying to like talk to yourself well and like not listen to that negative chatter in your head. And so like I, if I could pay for like people to somehow realize that with, with books or therapy or something, I would. But I really think that that is a huge key source is 
is is we're so wrapped up, especially here in the U.S. in the money, the parents, and the scholarships, and the medals, and the and the junior development team, and the hopes, and the twelve year old success. That like, it's really really uh, dangerous to start that way of thinking from a young way. And I've talked to some parents who have had kids that literally gone to the Olympics and gone all the way back through, and they said if I did it over again, I wouldn't do it because of how much harm it caused to me and how much unhappiness it brought my family versus being like, hey, this is cool. If you want to do this, we, we would like for you to have this meaningful goal, but I don't need this medal or this first place or this team to be happy. I don't need this, right? And I think that's very, very important for people. So, Mike. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a scary place right now for um, coaches to like self-reflect and, and um, take on that attitude um, of just being like working on themselves and and that being their source of uh, satisfaction, because I think although that is like the ultimate solution into in, uh, having that internal um, measure rather than constantly being like, what results do I have or what college do, scholarships have I gained or whatever. Um, I think right now people are scared of if they start um, self-reflecting and admitting any mistakes they've made, then they're going to be like um, attacked as like this, you know, terrible person. And they just, I think a lot of people are just gone into like a defensive mode. Like I'm not that bad, honest, like I am a good person. Like I'm not doing things wrong. Like, and actually like that doesn't, that's the worst thing you can do because, um, if you we are this isn't a witch hunt and we're not just trying to and i we're not just trying to call out the bad people there's only a few like we said there's only a small proportion of coaches that are like that and if even if those coaches that have done things wrong um if they just were to admit it then we would all we're all in the same team at the end of the day we just want the best for gymnastics and that is the scariest thing to do but also the it earns you the most respect and the most um, it allows you to move forward the most easily long term. So it like is a difficult thing maybe for some people to 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 start, but like in the long run, it's like the answer. Yeah, I'm so happy you said that and you brought it up because that's that's I can already heal hear the keyboards typing on people's emails. They're gonna explode in my inbox about the witch hunt comment and stuff like that. And if you uh, and I'm happy you said this too about how it's like people respect you the most for it. And of all the things I've learned and all the things I've done, the two things that have gotten me the most uh, connection and trust with athletes. Number one is admitting I was wrong and telling them I'm sorry, or I made a mistake. Like just the other night at practice, somebody like I set the board wrong and they like, the, like the vault looked weird. And I was like, Hmm, what happened there? Like the board is the board wrong. And I was like, Ooh, my bad. You know, I was like, sorry about that. But like just those little things, like they admit it, but like admitting that I make mistakes and that I've, uh, have, I've thought things that I no longer think like, it's crazy how much the girls and the other coaches that I work with respect me for that. And I respect them for that. There's nothing more irritating than knowing someone made a mistake and them having PR stunts put out about like, yeah, what well, was this person's fault or having some marketing campaign behind why you didn't make a mistake. It was like, get that out of here. I can smell that from like a mile away, right? We know exactly what's up. We know you made a mistake. Just admit it. And just move on and say, that's how you gain respect. But number two is doing the work. Me doing sled pushes and strength and conditioning with the girls that I coach and keeping myself fit and wanting to take care of myself and doing the work every day. They see all of our coaches in our gym doing the work on themselves and trying to get better. And you don't need to talk a big game because your actions see it for you. So if you say one thing and do another, they see through you like tissue paper. They understand exactly what's going on. So those are the two things that I think people should really take to heart and I'm, I, I definitely agree with you that like people really think the whiplash is coming. And Amy Borman said this about like the pendulum swinging too far the other way about how people are like, well, this is becoming a witch hunt. And every, every coach is now lumped together under the sexual abuse category. And it's like, no, it's not, it's not at all. That's not, it's not at all what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do is build a better version for the future where those who are not open to a new model and changing and admitting their mistakes, we don't want you to be a part of it anymore because you're not helping the forward cause. You're not helping what needs to happen. And so if you're not open to that, or you're not really willing to do the work, then you need to step aside and move on to maybe something else. But yes, if you're in that small minority of coaches who just lacks an, an impressive amount of self, uh, self-reflection, then you're going to get called out because you need to be like, you need, the pendulum should be swinging right now because look at all the destruction we've had in the last 30 years. For every 10 kids you see on social media with their gymnastics line story that you put out, there's a hundred that are scared to speak up. And so like we have to be willing to look at the entire spectrum of things that have gone right, wrong and need change if we're going to make any progress at all. So it, it's for a few people that deserve to have their feet held to the fire. It is a witch hunt because you deserve to be held accountable for the things that you did wrong. And for the 99.9% .9 of other people that are good coaches doing the right things, it won't be a witch hunt. It's, it's not going to be like that. We're trying to help you 
help us push people <laughs> away who are not good for your career in the sport. Cause those people make you look bad as a great coach. We need to highlight the good people and raise them up to the surface as examples. Yeah, definitely. And those people that do admit that they could have done things better and, and then are trying to do things better now and are, you know, completely jumping on board with this and, and singing from our song sheet. Um, we need to also make sure that, um, we're not, we're not canceling them because they admit to their mistakes. Um, so it's like, two sides of the same thing that we coaches need to be willing to work on themselves, admit their mistakes and move on. But also we need to be willing to accept that. And we need to be willing to encourage people to um, be educated and improve and not just, okay, you made one mistake. That's it. You're done like forever. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Claire, you have any thoughts on this before maybe the next uh, topic? Um, I don't think I really have anything to add to that one. <laughs> I think we covered it pretty well. Yeah. Make sure. Make sure. Um, yeah. So let's go. Let's keep going in towards of like what you guys are doing now because you guys have something super exciting that's coming along with Gymnast for Change. I think it's a really good way to kind of finish this conversation along the positive, happy note and, and the things that can change. So um, I know a lot of people have wanted resources and stuff like that. And I think that a lot of people still are kind of in this fear of the unknown stage where they want to change, but they feel as though they're pushing uphill against other coaches in the gym. I get that DM literally once a week or that email once a week about like, I'm trying so hard to do the right thing. But like every time I talk about using a new way to motivate the kids or we try a new thing, all I get is coaches that are saying I'm stupid. And like, how dare you think that? Like, that's ridiculous. You don't know what you're talking about. How dare you question me? And I feel like there's a lot of people who are really trying to do the right thing right now, but feel hopeless because they're stuck in an environment when they don't have really have that positive. And especially in coronavirus right now, like usually the answer is like, uh, leave the gym, but it's really hard for people to just like up and leave and bounce when their financial, you know, and insecurity right now is based on the gym that they coach at or who they work with or what they do. So what are you, how, how did this start? Let's talk about that. How did this start? And then can you guys maybe share about what your kind of first line items are on what you want to do with gym is for change. And then we'll talk about how people can support it and stuff like that. Jen? Um, yeah, I'll go first then. Um, so Gymnast for Change, as we heard earlier, so Claire behind the scenes has been doing so much stuff and she has um, been getting legal support uh, for Gymnast and she has been um, so resolute uh, an advocate for how gymnastics should be and the rights that athletes should have behind the scenes. Um, she, following her work setting up um a legal case to uh, fight for the rights and policies that we need to compensate gymnasts that have suffered and protect gymnasts in the future. Um, separate to that, but parallel to it, she set up um, Gymnasts for Change as a campaign to um, focus on the positive construction things that do need to happen and ask me to be involved. And I was so happy to be asked to be involved. Um, for the, for the same reason that obviously we come from different generations, but um, working together, we can hopefully um, act as a voice for the whole community to identify what those changes are that need to happen um, and ensure that those changes do actually happen. And it's not just like social media kind of blew up this year because everyone was sitting at home watching Netflix, but then 2021 happened and everyone forgot about it. Like we need to make sure this is the start of, uh, of the end of abusive practices um, and that we really follow through and make sure that those changes happen and that the athlete's voice um, isn't just lost across like individual Twitter accounts like um, from 2020, but like we continue to represent the athlete's voice and the coach's voice and the parent's voice and the fan's voice for the benefit of that athlete um, next year and beyond. Yep. Super well said. And Claire, I, I want you to go wild on this one because I know you've done so much work behind the scenes and also you're, we're tight on time for you. So anything else you want to share, let us know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess going back to your previous point, my perspective is that that issue of like, how do you get the culture to change and how do you get the, the coaches in the gyms to stop the, 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 the harmful practices that they've been doing for years and take on new, more positive coaching models. For me, uh, what I feel passionate about doing is pushing forward to this legal case to prove legally the ways in which, uh, gymnastics is harmful to gymnasts. Um, I believe that there is a mental health crisis within the sport, um, both for athletes who are still competing and for retired athletes. And I believe it's really important to prove legally the ways in which um, those harms are woven into the fabric of what gymnastics is. 
this idea of perfectionism, this idea of the pixie gymnast, the fact that it's currently a sport for little girls, it's not a sport for adults. Uh, I think that there's questions to be asked around the funding models and the way in which a, a slight lack of money actually causes um, coaches probably to be not that happy and maybe take out some personal unhappiness on kids. Um, it means that facilities are difficult to access and having few facilities, not very many of them, makes it difficult to switch clubs when you do realize that the the um, the gym that you're in is toxic. Um, what are you supposed to do? You don't currently really have very many options because it's only going to be the same um, at a certain level when you go to a different club. Um, so for me, I think at the moment it's, uh, yeah, I'm very focused on proving legally the ways in which these things cause harm long term. Um, not only because I know that I myself have struggled over the years with what I would call like, uh, you know, hauntings of my gymnastics experiences, but I'm also haunted by what I witnessed other people experience in the sport. Um, people, I think that currently the way the system works is the better that you get, um, the 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 more there's a special place in hell for you and the the worse your treatment is because you become more of a commodity to that coach so they really want to push you harder and harder and uh, what I witnessed um, as a 10 year old was um, a gymnast being pushed really to the brink and um, it stayed with me that's not fair and that needs to be proved you know we're not we're not talking about like snowflakes whinging that like they had to do a few training hours they don't want to do um, we are talking about a mental health crisis and the, the, that culture of fear that we've all witnessed now in watching Athlete A, it does cover up sexual abuse. Um, what I thought when I saw Athlete A was, okay, I didn't experience sexual abuse in my context that I trained in, but what I know from the Me Too movement is that we, we need to really ask questions about sexual abuse and that it shows up in a lot more places than we necessarily think. So when I started digging, I sure as hell found quite quickly, yeah, there was sexual abuse going on in the co training context that I was in. And so these things have to be proved legally because currently at the moment, coaches, parents, gymnasts, they like to often use this kind of thing of like, oh, well, are you telling me it's not like this in other sports? Um, are you telling me like, it's possible to succeed without being pushed to these degrees. And, you know, it's just that that gymnast wasn't made, they weren't, you know, they weren't made of, of the right material to be able to cope with it. it. It was the gymnast's problem. And it's just bullshit. And and I want to prove legally the ways in which that is bullshit and that the sport needs to reform in line with the law. Um, so for me, that's really what I'm focused on. But in tandem it's about bringing new ideas in it's about forming an alliance with gymnasts around the world who are doing amazing work and coaches around the world who are doing amazing work so people like you people like the um there's there's a group of um, 20 academics working out of australia and um, they've got incredible ideas um so we're, we're beginning to build partnerships um and it's about reimagining a new future for gymnastics. What, what could the sport look like in 10 years time if we are able to harness all of the amazing things that currently gymnastics has to offer? And then we partner that with all of the amazing things that are available to other sports, basic things that in other professional sports make those sports proper, legitimate, career paths for those athletes. Um, and, and I think that that is gonna involve um, looking at the ways in which gymnasts work with agents, managers, the commercial side of the sport. I, mean, I think it's a lot more commercialized in America than it is in the UK. Um, but all of those things are gonna be absolutely essential to creating longevity in terms of athlete careers so that um, you're not just on a kind of rubbish wage or that the people in gymnastics that can and decent wages are few and far between. We need to make uh, the, we need to push up the kind of median earnings of coaches and athletes across the board, so that everybody stands to gain from a stronger, better gymnastics. And we don't just have this situation in which there's basically one place for a female uh, gymnast in the British sort of media scene, and one place for for a male gymnast. Um, it needs to be that, like in the world of football or cricket or rugby, you can have a career post doing your sport. 
Yeah, very well. I'm so happy you said the point about education and that kind of stuff. Like that's, I still think that that's probably the number one complaint, especially on the medical side from parents and gymnasts and other people I see in the area that I work in when I travel and consult, they, they're they aware that the gym that they're a part of is not optimal. And they don't want to be a part of such negative culture and the pressure. And Jen Say said this really well in the, in the uh, movie about how you know, it's it's really so many people are complaining about the emotional and physical abuse alongside other things that are challenging. But parents like just shrug at me. They're like, well, there's no other gym to go to. Like my daughter wants to go to college and she has very high level goals. There's no other gym in the area to teach these really high level skills and get them on the radar of coaches and college recruiting is a whole different ball of wax for a different podcast in terms of like, you know, asking kids when they're 14 to make decisions about the rest of their life and where they go to school. Like that's, that's ridiculous. But so many parents and, and even the gymnasts are me. They're like, I'm like, why don't you try to change gyms? Why don't you try to find somewhere else? Why don't you know, like, well, there's no one who can teach me these skills and spot me and like do all these things that I need. And I'm like, man, that's, that's tough. And I think that that's why education is such an important part of this. If we get not only on the, I, I think shift has been become popular because we taught a lot of like hot topic items like flexibility, strength and whatever else, but like also like there's scientific literature behind how you motivate somebody the right way and how you create long-term athletic development and how you should speak to somebody in a conflict when they're not like, let's be real. Some kids come to the gym and talk a lot and they don't want to work out. And it's a problem. Like coaches deal with that. It's real, right? Like they're teenagers, right? But there's a scientific supported way to deal with that conflict and address that in a, in a proper way, not belittle the athlete and yell at them and just scream at them. Because I think what coaches lack in education, they make up for an in intensity in many different contexts, whether that's teaching skills, it's, it's not working. So just do 50 more, right? Or like, you're not fast enough, just go do a whole bunch of sprints, right? Or like, you're not getting this right, we'll just yell at you, right? Like they, that's their default trigger for solutions. And the education needs to be for, here's the 13 problems you're going to experience as a young new coach. And here are 13 sets of, of skills and tools that you can work on these things based on expert opinion and literature and stuff like that. And if we get more education and mentorship to these gyms at a regional level, there's no more I'm stuck in this, you know, this terrible gym that I want to stay at because of the scholarship. You have four other gyms who treat people well, and you can still get your nice high level scholarship. And I think that's a very real frustration that a lot of parents and gymnasts and coaches have where they're like, yeah, well, show me, a, show me, show, show me where to go and I'll go. And it, that doesn't require me moving my entire family across a four hour state guideline. So I understand that, but like, it really is a, a combination of education and then p positive peer pressure, right? We're like, if my coach next to me and who is one of my good friends tells me like, Hey, you're kind of doing some stuff. That's not cool. Like, are you okay? Like, do you need to talk about something like I, that resonates really well with me versus the, the fig or the governing body being like, you need to change because you're doing this. I'm like, all right. But if my best friend who I coach with tells me I'm doing something that's falling out of line, I'm going to really want to change that. So like we need to, in a constructive way, keep the bumper rails on all of our own communities to make sure that like, here's the, the universal moral conduct here's what we all apply by no matter whether you've gone to the Olympics twice or whether you're literally just starting off as a recreational coach, this is how we operate. And I think that's very important. Education and accountability together, I think are the solutions for starting at least what we're doing. So let's finish with this. Are there, where can people go? How can they help? What do you guys need help with the most? I'm very excited to be doing a lot of things behind the scenes to help you guys out, but I'm just one man. So where, uh, where can people help you? There's a lot of people who are going to listen to this and be like, I want to help. Jen, what do you think? I just want to quickly echo something that you just said, accountability and education together. That is, can we put that on a, a card sticker or something? <laughs> like, can we get that? <laughs> because I think it's kind of what Claire was saying as well. It's like we both need to recognize what's gone wrong and whether it needs you know, proving legally or um, demonstrating like the things that are, are, are wrong, that's important but without that education without that next step without a, this is how it's right and the awareness um they have to work together and so yes the uh gymnast for change campaign hopefully will um uh, will strive to well we have a, a number of principles and goals that um we're gonna uh they're gonna guide our um actions um and with it being focused on that next step, on that change I step, been, hence the name, the gymnast for change. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'll just read really quickly through them. Like, you can check out more information like uh, on the website. Um, but <laughs> our, um, our, like, guiding principles are, um, we've got seven of them. Um, it's representation of the athlete's voice, um, having representation of all types of backgrounds, diversity, accessibility to the sport, um, and then not being, like, this, checkbox you have to uh, to be like um innovation 
It's about the research. It's about the finding what those new methods are, collaborating with the experts um, that can identify how we're going to build a more positive and safe sport and then reform using those improved strategies to replace those harmful practices um, and broader policy reform um, where it can ensure safety. Um, and there's kind of, we can get into more details of that, but um, recognition. Um, so it's important also for a lot of people to move on um, for there to be, like I said, along with this education, a recognition of what doesn't work um, and um, we would like to see an apology from NGBs where they've got it wrong from FIG um, because that really helps uh, the individual athletes to be able to move on and to get to the next steps and how, here's how to do it instead. Um, amends along with recognition, you know, it just makes sense. Like we said, like, it goes hand in hand and um, where things have gone wrong, we need to make amends. Um, and I think long term, um, at least in the UK, we don't have like a sports ombudsman. Um, a lot of industries have like a place they can go. Um, if you're not happy with how a resolution or a complaint has been dealt with, there's an independent body for that. And that's really important to me because I don't think anybody can keep themselves accountable. Like even if it's just like you, you want a personal goal, I want to go on a run every day, you need someone else to keep you accountable for that. So there needs to be a, a permanent system for accountability, I think. Um, and uh, and there will be other things that we can uh, put in place to make amends um, and we'll come to that in the goals. Maybe Claire, you can go for the goals. Yeah, <laughs> um, <I'm> right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, redress, which again, hand in hand, um, compensation for those people that do need it and um, deserve it and will help them to heal. Um, and then obviously the seventh step is that healing itself. And we have uh, a whole load of resources on the website um, for to help people to make that step and help them heal if they have been affected personally but those kind of underlie what we want to do and then we have i think six initial campaign goals that are like a bit more specific about what we're gonna try and achieve um in the next year and well as soon as we can <laughs> <laughs> yeah claire do you want to share these or do you got a boogie yeah, yeah um and, and uh, just back on the healing side of things i just want to give a shout out to kay salisbury who we've been working with so she's a, a psychotherapist in the uk um, but also a former uh, gb rhythmic gymnast who mm. has experienced abuse in gymnastics and she's created some um, amazing infographics and put some resources on our website and um, it's going to be continuing to work with us over the coming months and she's she's brilliant because she gets it she mm. she gets it yeah. um okay so campaign goals are um we're looking for formal apologies as um jennifer said um the sports ombudsman and um we're pretty keen on the norwegian traffic like system that um they have there which is based on making sure that athletes don't go out to compete for their country unless they are in tip-top health um and ment good mental health yeah, and um, if you want to learn more about that, there's a there's a BBC documentary, isn't there, Claire? Did it come out this year with Colin Jackson? That's right. Yeah, Colin Jackson did an amazing documentary on eating disorders and being a professional athlete, um, and he covers uh, the Norwegian system and um, how brilliant it is. Um, and so, yeah, we would love to see that implemented here in the UK. Um, we're hoping to put together some athlete-centered coaching guidelines. Um, my experience of doing coaching uh, qualifications so far has been that at the moment, uh, British gymnastics still teach that there's a, a coaching spectrum and athlete centered is one approach and sort of the disciplinarian is another approach and they sit on a spectrum. Um, so what I would like to do is put more resources together in favor of athlete centered coaching in gymnastics, high performance states, all of the kind of amazing NLP work that is, is involved in many other sporting contexts, bringing that in to really help transform gymnastics and the way that coaches interact with their gymnasts to help them uh, produce results at the highest level, not just do that by starving themselves, which I've heard reports of, which is just horrific. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. I just want to that as well. Um, it's worth saying that there is a positive coaching module module that coaches have to take in the UK. Um, but like, if, you know, if people are going to point that out, oh, it goes with this, it's not enough. And it needs to be throughout the course. It's not just one thing you check off, oh, I did the positive coaching thing done. Like it needs to be at the heart of, of the how you coach. It's not just technical, it's also your approach. 100%, I agree with that one. Um, we'd also like to see um, an improved kind of water style monitoring and follow-up process for coaching um, as a way of uh, 
making sure that coaches are not using negative techniques and the cultures within each club um, that when somebody walks in they get a sense that the atmosphere is good and um, spot checks using a water style system would be really great um, we would also like to see here in the UK a, a, a binding review so that would either be a parliamentary review or a judicial review currently we have the white review happening um, which is good and remains to be seen what the findings are, but that's happening behind closed doors and the benefit of a parliamentary review or a judicial review would be that it would be happening in, in public. Um, and I think that we've seen quite recently that um, the Football League came slightly unstuck via uh, the parliamentary review and um, it's been very beneficial for, um, for British football. So we would like to see that happen for British gymnastics as well. Um, and then we would like to see compensation for those gymnasts who've been wronged. Um, in our legal case, we have got gymnasts with life-limiting injuries and um, with major mental health issues. We would like for them to be able to access the medical care and mental health care that they need to, to heal and, and find a way to live with their long-term injuries, which in some cases, you know, we've got gymnasts in wheelchairs. There's some pretty serious long-term life-limiting injuries that have come out of their participation in gymnastics. So. Um, Compensation is a really important part of that process. Um, and then another two that aren't on the website are, we would really like to see co coercive control um, be uh, something that can be applied outside of domestic settings. Currently here, it can only be applied in domestic settings, but coercive control is a really good description for what goes on in many negative coaching contexts. Um, and then the age restriction, I would love to see uh, the age restriction be pushed up to 18 so that um, we really start making this a sport for women, not for little girls. Yes, yeah. so well said. And Claire, I know you have to run, so feel free to go if you want. I, I do want to make one more point about um, the concept related to, you know, like reporting and safe sport. I think that is a huge thing we're still struggling with is, I mean, Rachel Den Hollander said this on an athlete a panel about how like, there's so many people who are still scared to speak up because of, you know, they don't stay anonymous and they start getting a lot of pr pressure from their gyms. I think that is a huge, huge issue. That's still a problem is like you need to have safe, anonymous reporting channels. And I, I want to make sure it goes both ways that if you have clear evidence and something has been wrong done to you that you get appropriate, quick, swift action and vice versa. When you do report that there's a, a, a formal uh, proper due process and that it's investigated so that we, again, go back to it. We prevent any like very, very rare circumstance where somebody weaponizes the safe sport system, you know what I mean? Against somebody and tries to witch hunt like that. That is such a minority case that it happens so rarely, but we do need to also protect coaches from maybe a crazy parent or some, somebody who felt wrong due to something like that. And I think the safe sport has the opportunity to make clear channels that are fast and anonymous and get proper review, but also there'll be bumpers and, and protection rails against that kind of like that uh, feedback whiplash when somebody maybe uses it inappropriately. So like that is so, so important to happen because right now I hear from so many people I want to say something in my gym. I don't agree with this, but as soon as I get one little peep, the parents are start gossiping about me. And then the coaches don't talk to my daughter and they treat me poorly and they threaten me. And I get the psychological warfare. Like that is a huge problem. That's not being talked about. And it's real. And we heard from Rachel and her uh, discussion with the FAA about how the, the serious mental health and, and other circumstances come up about their, their legality and things of that nature. So like, I, I just wanted to make sure that I really brought that up before we, we parted ways. Um, but I think we have, you want to share the clarity? Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I 100% agree. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you have great things to weigh in on the legal side. So I want to make sure if we do. Um, yeah. So we'll keep it that. I think we could have two more hours with you guys because you're you're doing such great work. And we'll definitely have a part two down the road once we get these things enrolling. But you guys can see them online. I shared the website and Twitter, social media. You guys are going to be able to participate so much. And I'm going to be helping a lot. I can't wait to share a lot of the stuff that we'll do together. So thank you guys so much for your time. Th thank you guys for all the work that you do. Like I said from the beginning, you are a light, shining light in a lot of people's lives for hope for change and for positive progress, along with some great coaches out there who are doing the right thing. And along with some people like Rachel and Jen, like everyone is doing individual great work that is making it still possible to catch your breath in this crazy time that we're living through. So thank you guys so, so much for what you do. I appreciate it. I was going to say thank you. Yeah. It's been amazing talking to you. Happy, happy. To thank you so much, Dave. And like, you're a part of this. And like you said, we're going to collaborate. And like, I mean, we can't talk about collaborating. <laughs> um, but we're going to, 
collaborate um, with everyone that we can. Like we want Jimmy for change to be. Um, it's not just like a few of us that have this charity that then decide what needs to happen with gymnastics like we are just a vehicle for everyone in the community to input into to find those solutions like we have these initial goals but like there's so many other things that people are talking about and can we look into this can we try this and like um this is not about like what i think or what claire thinks necessarily this is about um taking what uh, all the ideas that that people have and all the research that we have and putting forward um, and bringing it together so that we can achieve and find out what the best solutions are. Um, and, you know, like I said, we start with six goals. Claire's already mentioned two more that we need to look into. You know, there's like so many. Um, but yeah, I think by working together and by um, having this, this, these conversations and um, the positive input from everyone. And I've been so amazed and impressed by the community's engagement with Gymnast Alliance and willingness to stand up and speak and say what their ideas and what, you know, get behind the gymnasts. Um, just to continue that momentum would be absolutely incredible. And I'm really excited for, for that to continue happening because every step we take is a step closer to a future where all gymnasts just have all the best, amazing parts of gymnastics, which we love, you know, it's such a great sport. And there's so many benefits you can get from it in your life, not just from like a physical side, but like from, uh, you know, skills and emotionally and socially. And um, yeah, and if, if everyone could just access all those best parts of the sport, like it, I, I really believe it's the best sport in the world when it when it is that way. So um, I'm excited for us to be driving towards that for everyone. Yep, I completely agree. And everybody listening, everybody out there sharing this like, keep working, keep having the hard conversations, keep learning, like it's gonna happen. Like we, you are part of building the future of the sport that we can be happy and proud of to be a part of. So please don't give up, please continue to do your work. And, and we appreciate everyone out there who is doing the right thing. And I wanna say that as we end. So um, thanks so much guys. We will uh, get this chopped up right away and put out online. So we're looking forward to see everyone's response. Hope you guys have a great day. Thank you.